10 million Satoshis will be generational wealth. 1 million Satoshi is a really good amount. People living longer than their savings is a real problem. Like they outlive their own savings and then they cannot work anymore. Why is there inflation at all? Do you think the traditional financial space will survive? They will not survive <laughs> in this form. I love your uh, financial blog and also you, you switch from traditional, fi traditional finance to really focusing more on Bitcoin. Um, I mean, now you made a little bit of a break. We talked about it before, but maybe we can get into this a little bit later. Um, what I'm really curious about, your name of the show is really interesting. One million Satoshi, uh, because I'm always like 10 million Satoshis will be generational wealth at some point, but you seem to be like go one step lower than that, 1 million Satoshis. What, what is the significance for you of that amount of 1 million Satoshis? Well, in the beginning, many um, people asked me, where can I start? What can I do really in the beginning to invest in and buy, uh, of course, uh, Bitcoin? And I was thinking about a name that can be really uh, a good tip to really start. And we thought, or I thought that 1 million Satoshi is a really good amount to just try Bitcoin to know how it, what it means to really have a wallet on your own, even to send uh, Satoshi and try and practice how to do it. And uh, 1 million Satoshi is an amount that many, that is a lot. You have to really save it, especially now that the, that the, Bitcoin is worth much more than when I started. It really, you really have to save your euros and your fiat to get this one million Satoshi. But on the other hand, it's not so much that you're really afraid to spend it or even, okay, it's not a good thing and it's not a good feeling, but even lose it. So it's not, not such a big thing. And if you do the first step, if you have the one million Satoshi, then afterwards you will g gain more and more self-confidence and are ready to start and invest more in Bitcoin. Yeah, I think 1 million is already a great amount. And also it's, it's, it's just great to say like, oh, I'm a Satoshi millionaire. Like this, <laughs> this, this thing is, I, I, I love it a lot. And I always say to people who have no savings, especially people like they're 18 years old, they're just starting out, like get to 10 million Satoshis as quickly as possible. Like get to this goal, like mm -hmm. with, uh, especially it depends on where you live. 10 million satoshis could be out of reach uh but if you have the means to kind of you can think of like getting to 10 million satoshis which is now like six thousand euros six thousand uh, dollars around that uh that's a really great goal but uh, as you said like to start with like 600 uh, euros 600 dollars in, in bitcoin with one million satoshis it's a great start and really cool um but let's get into like why you kind of focused on bitcoin why you shifted originally from uh, more financial blocking to more Bitcoin blogging? In the start, in the beginning, when I started financial blogging, it was around 2020. So uh, right before, actually right before the uh, Corona crisis, uh, but then mid, in the midst of the Corona crisis, I started blogging about finance and I was not really aware of Bitcoin uh, to start with. I thought it is just a tool to get more money and someone invented it just to uh, gain, uh, to be rich. And uh, my thing was to do really sensible fi family finances, to really know what uh, ETFs are, to really know what to do if you um, want to save something when you're older and even provide something for your family and also for your kids. And that's why I started a blog and also a podcast with a podcast colleague and also a blogger colleague. And together we had for roughly one, one and a half year, a podcast around that topic. Later on, uh, he stopped his blog and podcasting. And in this phase, it was around 2021 or so, I discovered Bitcoin because we had a guest. We invited a guest who was... Um, someone well known in the Bitcoin or so, something well averse in the Bitcoin space. And he talked about Bitcoin and I was not uh, really sure what this is. And then I started to write an article about Bitcoin and this was uh, highly interested for many of our, of our readers. And this was the first step that I really thought, okay, there is something more than just an investment thing. It must be 
uh, something more that someone just wants to get rich. And after some research and a long research and thousands of hours, okay, not thousands, but hundreds, I guess, or oh, I think by now there are thousands of hours of research. I know I have a glimpse on what Bitcoin is and I maybe know a little bit about uh, Bitcoin. I thought, okay, this is a thing. <laughs> and uh, then I shifted my topic completely towards uh, Bitcoin and only wrote about Bitcoin and invited guests and talked about Bitcoin only. Oh, really cool. Is there some, uh, because I think like from podcasting, from speaking about something and from inviting guests, uh, also like mm -hmm. you learn a lot yourself, uh, at least it was my experience the half, last half year. Uh, what did you learn from blogging about finance and money before even uh, getting to Bitcoin? About finance in general, you mean? Uh, what uh, I yeah, like what are some, some learnings about money and, and finances? Yeah, well, right in the beginning, I was investing in it um, around 2010, so quite a long time for 14, 15 years by now. And I had some learnings because of that. And then I was right in the middle of the decision we had to children to babies and thought, okay, is it now good to have all our savings that was invested um, at the stock market to put everything into a big house. And um, in this point of time, I thought, okay, what would make more sense? And that's why I blocked a lot about it, what it makes more sense to having stock, your stock or having um, a house. And this helped me a lot. As you said, if you not only read about something, but also write about something and even try to teach someone <laughs> about it, really learn a topic by heart. And after several months, I was sure, okay, buying a house in this point of time is not the, the right decision for us. And looking back, absolutely, it was the right decision to not buy a house around the COVID crisis because the uh, price did go down afterwards. Maybe some say it's a bubble, uh, there was a housing bubble, maybe it was, maybe not, but at least you see that it was a good decision to not just bluntly buy a house without even knowing your finances. This is very important before that. Especially the area, I don't know how it's around the world. I, I, I talk with a lot of Canadians, Americans, and they also kind of kind of agree on that. But I know in Austria, and I think probably also in Germany, having a house is kind of like your personal savings account. Like most people view it as like that. Oh yeah, I'll, I, I get a loan. I work to the words that loan 10 years to 30 years, and then it's paid off. And that's kind of my pension. That's kind of my, my savings account, which I think is very wrong, but <laughs> a lot of people uh, view it as that. Um, it's, it's really interesting to get down to this rabbit hole. Why, why did you decide to not get in this real estate? I feel like a lot of people actually go exactly down this route, like they're like, oh, everyone needs houses. There, there will always be a demand for houses. All those those easy to understand arguments for real estate, which are, I think not true, but uh, how, how did you decide? I think it was really hard because it is was always such a lifelong dream. Like, you know, if you're a small girl, <laughs> you don't know that already. But uh, it was also always a dream, you know, to get married, to have kids, to have a own house, to have a garden. And this is something that um, was in my life as well. I thought, okay, if you really save everything and if you work hard, uh, later on you and uh, you, you can buy absolutely something like that. You can have a, a, a real estate somewhere and then you can live there with your family. And it's not only an investment decision in this uh, thing. It's a really, really emotional decision. It's like a symbol of something that you build and that you are proud of. And it was really hard in this time. It took me really several months or even years to understand that uh, this dream has been hijacked somehow by by people that get you um, that make a profit of it so maybe the the banks or even state because you see that the people tend to vote more conservative if they buy a house and that's uh, why there is an interest of many people uh, and many people that make profit and make money fiat money from you that you have such a real estate and I think it was a kind of awakening experience that I thought, okay, this is, was my childhood dream, but <laughs> some, somehow uh, is just telling me that it should be my dream. But on the other hand, it has a really backside. And this backside is that you 
have a high uh, that you have to a high credit that you have to work all the time that you maybe don't see your children that often because you have to be at work that you have to work until you uh, get your pension and that somehow you I, I had only in German this word hamsterrad it like a hamster wheel <laughs> that you keep having oh, uh... maybe I, I actually have no clue what's that in English. That's <laughs> no, so funny that because like, I talk all the time, like it's this nine to five. I think in English, a lot of people just call it matrix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, makes I don't, sense. I don't know if it's this, this word actually <laughs> is, is something in English. I never heard it, but yeah, I think this, this, uh, uh, this this wheel card uh, of like just being in there and and not only like getting in there like it's, it's I think a lot of people just make the comparison with the matrix. I don't know if this really is a good comparison, but I think a lot of people like just call it oh you're like going in the matrix fiat mining. Uh, <laughs> well, I have to research if there's a good word for it. Yeah, me too. Maybe someone wants to comment and have it <laughs> on the on the right word on the, the video. Um, yeah, but I thought, it, okay, this is not the, the life I want to be because a big uh, value of mine is being independent. And this way I knew that I cannot be independent. And I think this, I developed this value in my life because I read quite early Ayn Rand, Ethel Struct. And somehow this book did something to me. And I knew that being independent and having a life I want to have and not something others want me to do is really, really important in your life. And money and having your finances right and being independent, not to spend a lot, just to be independent is crucial to that. And I knew that if we buy this real estate, we would not feel free anymore. Yeah, it, it kind of kind of your, your own house and slaves you do the work for it uh the your whole your life because like most loans are 30 years uh, as i see it some go with 10 years uh but 30 years like you start doing that with 30 you do it till 60 you basically all your working life you are <laughs> tied to that house mm -hmm. and and then there we come to this discussion where most people with uh 60 there are a lot of studies on that like most people uh once they get uh, into um, uh, pension and they go to the retirement age, uh, really soon all those um, illness started and all those things start with, with the problems. And then you're like, oh, you finally are in retirement where you always wanted to be. And then, oh, your body does not uh, do it because you uh, hammered down your body for like 30 years to get this loan right. And then you cannot even enjoy it. So like a lot of things uh, are, are wrong. And I think even like the, the problem of people living longer than their savings is a real problem. Like they, they, they outlive their own savings and then they cannot work anymore. Then the, the, the kids of them have to step in and stuff like that. Like there are a lot of problems in that, in that fiat world, which uh, I see and I had yesterday actually a guest on who has a funeral business uh, and he uh, has around 5,000 families uh, per year uh, in his funeral business that he deals with. And he uh, really got some interesting perspectives on, on that because he deals, a, he deals a lot with grieving families, with, with what, what people regret in life. And that that's, he, he sees a lot of that like, People want to spend time more with the families, more time with what they actually like to do. And I think a fiat system really has something to do with that because people cannot really save in anything. They, they try to save in the euro <laughs> and they <laughs> get screwed over <laughs> over the long run with that. And even if they save in their house, it kind of keeps up with inflation, but you have to work for that loan. So it's a it's a it's a bad thing to to begin with um which also brings me to my actual first question that i had for you um what wh what do you think is the best thing that bitcoin does for for humanity uh when when we look at that when we look at all the things that we already discussed what what is for you the the thing that bitcoin kind of brings in a, a more holistic uh view well when i discovered bitcoin it was not so much about much how the how it's worth in fiat and how it develops over time. It's more another way to see the world. And it was the first time I really uh, discovered this other angle on the world. Well, it's hard to say because um, I really had some libertarian views before Bitcoin, but they were more diffused, not something, sometimes I had a, 
an opinion on this and then on this. And um, it was not really, how could I say, Bitcoin made the picture for me so that I really see the, the connections behind that and uh, see how in general this is uh, working it some of all of the sudden the world made made more sense to me so that it it should be every decision should be decentralized that there should be in politics and so on not someone who is guiding the way but more letting the people do what they decide and i think this point of view i i somehow had but it was i did not discover it really <laughs> it bitcoin helped me to discover that uh, and this was a, a great moment. And of course, all the, the Bitcoin community, the people that stood behind Bitcoin and immediately uh, liked Bitcoin. And somehow this, the, these people are somehow very different, but somehow all the same. And I really like to be there in the community. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a massive community. I feel like uh, Bitcoin kind of enables you to critical think about what you are doing with your <laughs> with your time and with mm -hmm. and you it, it values your time differently um which brings me to the topic uh, we we kind of triggered before um why did you pause your, your, your podcast now and wh what was the the reasoning for that well i did my podcast next to my job and uh, my aim was always to uh, live to uh, to live a, a life uh, with the things I love independently so that I do not have to uh, work for a company, um, no matter which company, but really self be self-employed. And by the beginning of this year, I managed to do so. Um, I bought with two other uh, friends of mine a company, and now we are working on our own company, on our own aims and our own targets we have. And I really enjoy it a lot. So this is one part. On the same time, it is really good news for me <laughs> so that I really uh, reach that goal. But on the other hand, I do not have a goal in this regard anymore so that I can really live with the things uh, I love, which, which was on the other hand also not so good message because I really had to find something new, a new target for me. And I'm now, now right in this transition mode. Is it that I want to do it again and keep on continue doing uh, with my podcast with an, one million Satoshi, any million Satoshi, or do I want to do something else next to my job and have a different goal? Because now I already have the big thing in my life <laughs> so that I can work and earn something without, um, yeah, without be working for another company. If you watch or listen to my podcast on a regular basis, I guess you already bought some Bitcoin. And now the most important step is to keep the Bitcoin. Keep them secure in a hardware wallet. My personal recommendation for hardware wallet is the Bitbox. It's super secure. It's simple to set up. It's also a perfect gift for a friend who has still the Bitcoin on an exchange. And you can get a 5% discount with the code Robin at the check out visit bitbox.swiss slash robin to get your bitbox and if you really want to bulletproof your self-custody setup your security setup and maybe even your citizenship set up you have to talk to the bitcoin way if you go to the bitcoinway.com slash partners slash robin you get a 30 minute free call where you can dive deep with them if your self-custody setup is secure, if your citizenship is secure or maybe might be improvable, or your digital footprint in general is secure. They are the experts in cybersecurity, in Bitcoin self-custody, and how to be a secure, sovereign individual in general. And for those of you who are in search of a new Bitcoin exchange where they can buy their Bitcoin from, I recommend my personal Bitcoin exchange 21 Bitcoin. With code Robin, you get a hefty discount for all your purchases in the future. Also, you made this year the, the jump from being employed to being self-employed uh, yes. with, with uh, someone else. Uh, uh, do, can, can you share what, what are you doing? Uh, yeah, we having a small, we are small publisher. We are publishing books uh, around ease, simple living, minimalism, how to, um, yeah, do everything on your own at home <laughs> with uh, different plants and, uh, yeah, and also some basic ingredients to your uh, cleaning 
uh, substances like natro, soda, uh, and soap and something. And if you have the right recipe and put everything together, you get, uh, yeah, you can clean everything in your house. And this is, uh, these are the books about. Oh, Some, really cool. Yeah, we are all Bitcoiners. We are thinking of also publishing a book about Bitcoin, not that they are not so, they are really good already on the market, <laughs> but maybe we do not publish a book about Bitcoin itself, but somehow we can maybe mention it <laughs> so that <laughs> it can be a part of, uh, of minimalism and uh, yeah, simple living. I think there can never be too much education. Like mm -hmm. there's this saying like, oh, there are already so many Bitcoin books. There are already so many Bitcoin things. No, they're not. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, if, if there were too, already too many, then nobody would buy a Bitcoin book. Like then, then all of the new Bitcoin books that come out would not find anyone to, to, to buy it from. So uh, I, I think if, if there's too many, you will see it in the sales numbers. Like if nobody buys it, I also got that like, oh, there are already so many Bitcoin podcasts. Oh, I guess, I guess people still watch my podcast uh, uh, and I can even now live on, on, on that podcast. So I, I think there's, there's always demand for education. There's always demand for uh, a new angle, a new perspective on things. Uh, and, and the same with, with, with books. I, uh, I, I, I would love to see a published book from you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good to hear. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that sounds exciting. <laughs> uh, is, is, is that published, uh, but you're the publisher, so you don't write the books. You, you only have uh, writers that then write the books and then you're publishing them for them. Uh, no, I also write the, uh, also write the books. What we are doing is just, we publish them online and then afterwards, if it's, um, there's enough interest about it. We publish the, the recipes or the, the content, but we, um, yeah, it, it's most of the time we are writing the oh. books by ourselves. Oh, really cool. Really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, really cool. One absolutely question that has nothing to do with, with Bitcoin. Do you have advice for someone who wants to write a book? I'm kind of thinking of, of doing something like that. I'm, I'm having some, I wrote some articles. Uh, and the articles are just there for me to clear my mind and, and think of like, oh, what, what's my thoughts around Bitcoin? What's my thoughts around th this and that? Uh, and my thinking is like, uh, I just want to clear my head with that. But I'm like, oh, this, those articles are getting very long. I didn't even, even publish it. It's just the Google Docs that I have to actually just for me. Uh, but th they are getting so long that I'm like, oh, maybe I can even make a book out of that. Like, do you have some something to uh, as an advice? Well, I would start small, like having eBooks and uh, selling it for I don't know three, four euros, and see if the, the the topic catches. I would also start a blog. It also makes a lot of sense to um, yeah collect everything you have, and then you see what people interest and what are not so interesting for people is not so interesting for people. And then if you have not enough content, and I know it's really hard, it's really hard. <laughs> you have to do it for several, I, I think, uh, several years and write a lot. I would e even recommend to write every day. Then you have a lot, a not enough content. And the next step would be if your eBooks are selling quite well to have even a self-publisher or go to um, a publisher, but it's really hard. You know, many, many people write to us that they want, that they have a good content and so and uh, yeah, most of the time we cannot do it because we have to test it. We have to do it on your own, on our own because it's a big risk to print a book. It costs a lot. Uh, and yeah, and I would recommend even we doing that. We are doing not writing a book and then we're selling it. We're just testing it all the time online and having eBooks and so on. And then we're testing and if it's okay. And if the people like it, then we at some point point in time we are writing it maybe. i mean do, what, what's your opinion on like uh and did not research a lot in, in this regard but i heard that you can just uh, put your book on amazon and if someone buys it they print it then for you uh mm -hmm. you can have an ebook and, and kind of test the, the the markets and uh also with like even audiobooks like i'm a big audiobook uh fan i'm, I'm like mostly on audible and, and and hear it you can i can do it basically myself just talking in the microphone and do my audiobook. Uh, other question is if someone is willing to listen to it, mm. but um, it's like going to like an Amazon or going to some self-publishing thing, uh, the f a good first step. 
Mm. Yeah, it it is a good first step. And I think you're doing also already the first step, like building up a community. It's not so, it's it's easy to write a book. Everyone writes a book, but it's not, what's not easy is to have the community that buys the book and you have to build the community. And I think this is something you are doing right now with your podcast. I would even recommend also a blog, something that it's written, that's written, or even have a newsletter um, community and you write something to them once a week. And then if you have enough content, you can compile it like having self-publishing at Amazon is a good idea also. Um, having ebooks at Amazon and I think, I don't know if it's a possible in Germany, I don't think so, but Amazon also has the audio version of your book so that someone professional reads your book and you can sell also this. If you do not want to read it on your own, it's just <laughs> just an, an, another option. And um, yeah, I think that the hard thing is building up the community. Yeah, it's it's also like uh, there's this popular saying. I forgot who said it. Like uh, first time founders worrying about the products and services they're building. Second time founders are worrying about the distribution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. first you're like oh my product has to be real. no you have to find people that actually are willing to yeah. buy it. like why build something if nobody uh, is buying it i mean if you only build it for yourself for example like my, my articles i don't even publish them i just want to clear my heads because what i saw is like i'm getting invited to other podcasts uh, and they ask me oh you haven't <laughs> you interviewed now almost 200 bitcoiners like what are your main learnings and i'm like oh shit there are like 500 answers in my head and i cannot decide <laughs> on one uh and so this was kind of my reasoning why i want to have an article because i think writing is a great um clearing your mind on on something and that's really cool one thing that i'm curious about uh with you is how did when you were from traditional finance you learned a lot from that then you switched to bitcoin did your view on money in general, uh, on your view on finances change with Bitcoin? Is, is there something that uh, changed when you adopted Bitcoin or is, was the mindset already there uh, when you adopted it? Um, well, I had a quite, in, in backside, a quite good um, understanding. Yeah, good understanding on money because uh, in 2010, I started to investing because of inflation of 2%. And many people say, okay, 2% is not an, it's not, not a lot. But on the other hand, I just, just calculated that uh, 2% means that my money is only worth half of it in 35 years. And it makes absolutely no sense to save money on my bank account. And, but what does, what's the difference before and after Bitcoin is before Bitcoin, I just, was looking for ways to invest my money differently. It was also what can I only, only what can I do to avoid inflation? And after Bitcoin, I somehow discovered the why more. So why is there an inflation at all? I've never asked that question before. I just looked for solution to avoid inflation, but not never asked a question, why is inflation there? And Bitcoin helped me a lot to understand the why even better. And there is a, even a tool if you want to find your vision on your, for your company or for your life and so on, to ask four or five times why. So why are you doing this? So and why is this important to you? And this way you discover your your goals way better and understand your life way better and find, find a sense in your life way better. And Bitcoin helped me a lot asking the why questions. If you, if you keep asking why, that uh, can, can be a painful experience and can be uh, some, <laughs> something <laughs> like, oh shit, like, why do I do that actually? Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. Also, it's, it, it's interesting that you got that inflation is bad, like, especially with like only one or two percent, if your assumption is, oh, it's, it's just two percent inflation. Most people don't get that. Like most people, I think inflation is always a little bit higher than two percent when we look at asset prices, inflation, stuff like that. But even two percent, most people are like, ah, it's not that bad. They, they're like, ah, okay, it's just two percent. But then you get to the point where, like, oh, the, like every year, uh, someone comes into the house and takes one small item. After a few years, you're like, oh shit, where all the things are gone? Like, uh, that's like, why, why did you I feel like <laughs> most people don't get that? And I'm always curious, like, why people uh, get that? Even like now, when I speak with someone, and inflation is so high. Uh, with like 10%, maybe 15%, depending on what metrics you're looking at, they're like, no, no, it's not that bad. 
like oh my, my supermarket bill is not that much higher they they, mm-hmm. they don't seem to to see the problem even and you have to see the problem before you can see the solution <laughs> why, th- why do you think people don't get that i don't really know it's maybe it's something i've al- always liked mathematics i, l- I always li- liked numbers so i somehow had have a good feeling for numbers um and i know that it there's not only the interest but also the <laughs> how is it called if in the, the compounding effect of the the compounding effect yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah. and that uh, humans do not understand it and i do not understand it as well but i thought it is a big thing <laughs> to have the compounding effect to know the compounding effect and then i think i'm someone who is when when i see a problem i i really want to do it i'm a very <laughs> um, hands-on person and I see that sometimes with my friends, they really see the problem as well, but they do not really do something But because the, the life is full of stress, especially, of course, if you have uh, children and so on. So you have so many things to do and you do not think that you, it, it seems to, to really open uh, a, a wallet and to really buy Bitcoin and to uh, learn the technical know-how. It seems to be a big, big burden. So, uh, what I wanted to do with my podcast is also to make this burden easier to say it, okay, it's not, not that hard and it can be also fun. And a lot of um, people who did hear the podcast said to me that they never have been interested in finance, but once they hear, hear an episode now, they're really interested because it's something different. It's not only finance. It's also a spiritual, I would not say awakening, but Bitcoin is something else that you see the, the world different than before. It's more than just finance and money. And um, I think many people maybe understand money way better if they somehow invest more time in Bitcoin and even see Bitcoin from a different point of view so that they can optimize their life even with this cryptocurrency. <laughs> It, it, it kind of all comes down to the ownership then, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's like you have to take ownership of, of your life. You have to take ownership of, of, of your Bitcoin. Why do you think uh, is, is that important? Like t- taking ownership, taking self-custody, taking owning your own decisions, also owning your own life, owning your time? Yeah, because Bitcoin will never earn, it will never be yours if you do not do it on your own. So I heard so, from so many, especially from so many women, ah, my, my husband has Bitcoin, we have Bitcoin. But it's not that you you have Bitcoin together. It belongs to one. And it's okay that uh, your husband always helps you and uh, explains you what Bitcoin is, but you never can have one Bitcoin together. It's either his or <laughs> yours. And so somehow you have to also learn it if he passes away, you know, that you know how to do, work with it, that you, ha- you know how to send it and to know how to uh, give it to your children. And uh, I think this is a very important skill and you cannot say that, yeah, we have Bitcoin because my husband has Bitcoin. It's, <laughs> um, yeah, a big difference. And that's why, of course, in, within a family, you do not calculate everything. Uh, you have, we, in our family, we also have a joint bank account and we pay everything together. And we, I do not say it's his money or her money. But in the end, Bitcoin is some a, a different tool. So to say, you really have to know what you're doing. You really have to be confident in working with Bitcoin. It's not that big issue, but you have to really learn it and practice it. And that's why it's quite different to a normal bank account. Yeah, and it's like, as you said, like with with a normal bank account, there's a judge who rules it. Like if, if, if then the judge says, oh no, like this money belongs to her or like, oh, he passed away, then mm-hmm. of course it gets to her with bitcoin it's different if, if if he only knows how to access the bitcoin and he passes away the, the bitcoin are gone yeah. <laughs> no, no charge can rule on that yeah. like instead I, I saw also um, a presentation you did at less farm or orange uh, it, mm-hmm. it, that was uh, uh, also really cool how how do you see in, in general like this this whole like i know i have my uh, my statistics uh, on the podcast and I improved a lot on those statistics <laughs> until now. <laughs> I had uh, in the beginning like 4% of uh, female viewers. Now I'm like coming slowly to 10%, like I'm oh. like 7, 8%. Uh, and even like really big ones like Natalie Brunel, she posted a statistic. She had like 20% female audience, mm. which is like 
she's a female um host she has a lot of female guests on uh and still she with such a female focus only has tw like 20 percent. so like <laughs> it seems like it's a very uh, male focused uh, uh group it's like tech tech coming towards money and both are like <laughs> kind of dominant on that one how do you see it? like do, do you think that that will be more or different question is it harder to orange peel a uh, woman i'd say yes as you said, the, the interest in in tech and finance, you, you have to be interested in these two topics, at least to have enough self-confidence to say, okay, I do not understand everything, but uh, I go to the meetups, to the Bitcoin meetups, nevertheless, and learn. And uh, many women have, if you, <laughs> I, I just have to, uh, if I see my the, the ads I see on YouTube, when I go into YouTube and all the shorts, I see are mostly advertisements targeted to men. Because I see so many Bitcoin videos and tech videos and finance videos, YouTube obviously thinks I'm male. And that's why I always get, get advertisements that are obviously targeted for men with young young ladies and so on and being rich and having a good car and so on. And that does not interest me at all, but I'm interested in tech and finance and somehow even the algorithm of YouTube does not understand that, that you are female and interested in, in tech. It's yeah, confusing for them. So yeah, it is how it is. It's harder for, uh, but nevertheless, I think we are different. I think every gender has its own uh, advantages. And yeah, I also see it in my, my children. I have a, a, a girl and a, and a boy. <laughs> and my boy is very interested in, in Bitcoin. He's very interested in tech and 3D printing. And uh, my, my girl, she's okay, she's five. She's, but even when my boy was five, he was interested in Bitcoin. And my, uh, my daughter is interested in, yeah, you know, interested in caring for for the cat and caring for the garden and something like that. It is how it is. But nevertheless, when I was a girl, I was also interested in something like that, you know, also having cats and so on. And still I was, I'm interested later also in Bitcoin. So it's not nothing that women cannot understand or are slower in understanding Bitcoin and something like that. But they are definitely harder to orange peel because the interest that's just different. Yeah. I, I think the the best quote I all uh, heard on that is like women are more interested in in, in people and, and men are more interested in in things. Like I, I know uh, when I hear my girlfriend talking with her best friend, it's very different than when I talk to my best friend. <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> like it's very different topics. <laughs> I, I, I talk about. Uh, my business, I talk about money, I talk about Bitcoin, I talk about all those things. And then maybe rarely like five, four percent of the conversation is like, oh, how am I doing as a person? How is, <laughs> or, or like that. Like, and, and, and when I talk, hear my girlfriend, it's like 95 percent that and then five percent something else like it. It's, mm -hmm. But I'm very proud of her. She she's now kind of orange pilling the, the company where she is working because they asked her, uh, they asked they asked her what she she's uh, what uh, his boyfriend is doing like me uh, and he's like oh he's in bitcoin and then and now everyone comes with bitcoin questions to her and she, <laughs> she she's not a, a bitcoiner in the company <laughs> <laughs> oh that's cool that's really good it's good to hear yeah it's it's just an average uh, of, from, of the of the gender and there are always exceptions and so on <laughs> absolutely <laughs> I, I, many yeah, i think that's it's always important to note that that's like uh, not everyone is like that but that's like an uh an uh, in generalization and an average thing of mm. that um just so uh i think we had it uh, like t few times already in the podcast but i like to highlight it always um what is less fun orange because i think that they are doing a really cool job and they're doing a really cool thing uh maybe you can do something like uh, what, what is that and, and why are they doing what they do yeah i think Le Femme orange uh, were founded uh, one and a half years or so and they're regularly uh, creating events in the bitcoin hotel the infamous bitcoin hotel uh, nearby stuttgart and in Plochingen uh, is it and uh, they are inviting a lot of bitcoiners in this space and um, yeah having a, a meetup several i think two several days uh, and two nights and so on and then you can connect with other 
women also there and uh, talk about Bitcoin and how it works. And there are also workshops and how you practice doing Bitcoin. And what they also do, I think, is a bit at big Bitcoin events that they organize community meetups. Yeah, I just looked at it. I think end of July or like very soon. Actually, yeah, in three days, it seems okay. like there's the, the next one in, in, in Hotel Blochingen. <laughs> <laughs> when, do you, when do you plan to, to broadcast? Uh, sure. After that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. Then so, so, you can say three days. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so uh, it, it already happened. Like it's it's uh, uh, at the same time that uh, Bitcoin in Nashville, uh, the big conference in, in Nashville, Tennessee, is also happening. Uh, will be also really interesting to, to to see Trump talking about Bitcoin and all the things. <laughs> <laughs> whole whole different uh, conference at Les Femme Orange, but I would actually be probably rather at, at Les Femme Orange than at Bitcoin Nashville. Yeah, uh, I, can, I can definitely recommend uh, Les Femme Orange and there's a really good uh, feeling and a good atmosphere there. So, Absolutely, okay. absolutely. Um, uh, before we come to the end routine, um, you talk, come from the traditional uh, financial space. Do you think um, the traditional financial space will survive or better question what parts of the traditional financial space like we have ETFs we have the uh, exchange market with all those things will, will they all survive and just be a little bit different on a Bitcoin standard or how do you see like this uh, thing evolving over the next like 20 years obviously uh, impossible <laughs> to answer the question <laughs> but uh, it's always fun to speculate Mm. I hope they will not su not survive <laughs> in this form. <laughs> uh, I think there they always be some room for really bank stores so that they go there and ask someone for I don't know for for advice how to set up your wallet or even ask someone <laughs> and you pay them one how to plan your um, your heritage um, and also give it to your children and there will also be room for really storing your hardware wallet, your physical hardware wallet. I think this is very important service uh, options and that still will, still will be there in the Bitcoin standard. And it's really, really important and was really important in the past, but there's such a big part of the bank and finance part that won't be very uh, important anymore. Uh, especially the, tight connection between finance and state. And this is the the thing that is most worrying so that the stay, state always bail out the banks and disconnections, disconnection will not be anymore. And I think that's why we are going to have a world that it's peaceful and uh, not so stressed, more um, sustainable because you do not buy everything because you can have a credit. And uh, this gives would would remove a lot of friction, and I think we only discover that if we are there, and on the way it slowly gets better and better. But I think it will not be the same like today. It will be definitely uh, changed a lot. I also feel like that. Um, last question before the end routine that I give to every one of my guests: um, What can we learn from you besides Bitcoin? You can learn from me how to write articles that uh, are visible on the internet i love it perfect <laughs> that, that's a very good skill honestly <laughs> especially the visible part <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's hard <laughs> it's hard uh, it's yeah. hard yeah perfect then uh thank you so much we have an end routine uh where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is um the question for you is what's one thing that you do that keeps you from having big regrets in life <laughs> this question I comes from the the guy with the funeral business <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, very interesting questions. I like it a lot. I, I just do everything I think it's worthwhile to do. Uh, really cool. It's uh, I guess it's hard to determine like what's what's worthwhile to do, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it isn't. Sometimes I'm wrong, <laughs> but in general, I try it. Yes. Uh, really, really cool. Perfect. And uh, thank you, Eva, for for being on my show. It was a pleasure talking with you. Um, before I let you go, where can people find you, reach out to you, ask you questions? 
Yeah, you are really happy to visit animillionsatoshi.de and also my podcast, Any Million Satoshi. I'm really happy if you also subscribe to the newsletter and ask me a question directly and I'm happy to answer it. And thank you very much, Robin. It was a real pleasure being invited to your podcast. It was a big fun. It was big fun, though I have not spoken English, I think, for a year or so. <laughs> yeah seven, eight months or so, but it was really fun and I really liked it. And I love your um, your attitude and your target you have that you want to invite a big, a, a many, many people from the Bitcoin space, no matter where they come from and uh, what they are doing. So a great idea. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, thank you also for, for joining us today. Thank you for everyone watching and listening for joining us today. As always, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. <laughs>